Righty ho, let's make a start. <laughs> you should all be used to the routine, but you probably don't need me really, do you? I could just put the symbol up and you can imagine what I'm saying, but I'll just come forward a bit before I hit the wall. So, turning gently. When we start off with this, it's generally a case of sort of feeling, feeling the, the movement starting up. I, I, I think it's sometimes a bit like sort of starting up on your bike first thing in the morning or in a car. You just, it just takes a few moments to, to properly settle in and to get your bearings. And in particular, I think, obviously that's a physical thing, but in terms of your mind and a feeling of just arriving in the movement. I sometimes find I go out in the morning, I always start with this. And what happens is I'm sort of standing there and at some point I kind of wake up, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm here. <laughs> sort of this sense of, yes, yeah, suddenly I'm here rather than too distracted in my mind or whatever. And I think as we get used to that process, we, well, I would say it's quicker, or easier, but it's a sort of smoother route inwards. As always, I think for me, this is one of the great benefits of a, a practice like Tai Chi, that we get used to finding a way into that centered space, that feeling of quietness and stillness. And it becomes a, a, a part of how we think and how we act. I have no verification of this, but it seems to me likely that one of the things that we're doing is simply training our nervous system and our brain to respond to the intent that we want to find that that quieter space, a sort of pathway begins to establish itself. I like to think of the phrase that is apparently used by neuroscientists when they're referring to these pathways, these neural pathways, talking about the nerve cells, the neurons, and the phrase is that neurons that fire together wire together. And this is how we remember certain actions. Going into our kitchen to put the kettle on, opening our door with our key, all sorts of things that we do with our hands in our pockets are programmed into our nervous system. It's neurons that fire together, wire together. Like any pathway, if you walk it frequently, then it becomes easier to walk. If you have a shed at the bottom of your garden and you don't go there for several months, when you walk down the path, it'll be a bit overgrown. But if you walk down there regularly, it'll be easier to, to traverse. So the elements that we, we bring into this, the things that we begin to focus on, our feet, our legs, our hips are always primary in Tai Chi. You may find that maybe you're a bit stiff in your back or one of your legs or something like that. That's quite normal. Hopefully the exercises will begin to just release that stiffness a, a little. Weight dropping down, hips dropping back. So this feeling of your pelvis hanging and the, the loosening around your hips and your lower back, allowing for a, a freer movement right up through into your shoulders. And you should, to begin with, get this feeling, or use this idea if you prefer to think like that, of a, of a sort of central pole, let's call it, like the axle of a wheel that you're turning around. Gradually, 
over a period of time and practicing, we realize, of course, there isn't such a, uh, a, a sort of structure within the body. What we do have is a, a central part of the body that is perhaps a little bit denser, a little bit stronger, but it's not immobile. So to begin with, it's a good idea to think in terms, for instance, of, of, of your spine as staying still and your body moves around it. Again, like the axle of a wheel. But you, you will after a while begin to realize that there are little movements in and around the spine that the vertebrae move slightly and so on and so forth. But you shouldn't try to make that happen. You can observe it when it happens. But particularly if you have a problem with your back, you really don't want to, to force that. And it's just a natural progression really from the postures and from the movement. And so it's one of the one of the factors that gives us a little bit more movement over a period of time. And then you raise your arms with your arms in a set position like this. It's sometimes easier to feel those connections from feet to shoulders and out to your hands. I missed out the hips then, hips should be in there as well, of course. Because you've got a definite shape that's moving through the air. Good, and then the hands drop down. <clears throat> Let's take that a little bit further and go into this exercise swaying in the river. Start with just rocking your weight forwards and backwards. And concentrate on the soles of your feet. And you'll find that the the range of movement in your feet is quite small. As I said before, roughly from the front part of the heel to the point just behind the ball of your foot. It will take a centimetre or two, depending on you know, whether your hips are soft or whatever. But quite a small movement. And feel that movement building through your legs Soften your knees, soften your hips. So you may just feel that the bones of your legs are moving slightly. And again, that's obviously going to be quite a small movement. But these are the initiating movements. These, these are the movements that gradually build wave-like through the body, up into your hips and your pelvis and then your spine, ribs. And then finally your arms, your hands out to your sides. And you imagine being in the river. So as you go forwards, you feel the pressure of the water against your chest and your belly and the palms of your hands. And your hands are left behind slightly. And then they come through. And then you need to find a way to come back. And don't overthink that. Don't try and sort of analyze exactly what you should be doing with your hips and your knees and your shoulders but rather have this idea that this is what you want to do just keep reminding your body of that idea and you'll find that you gradually begin to make the movement and you can then see how your body's actually doing it so for instance one of the things that I notice is that when I'm forwards here, when I want to go back, there's a definite sort of sense that I want my hips to go back. I, want, I really need to release that, that, that area. Maybe there's a little bit of a push from the front of the foot and so on. So these are really not quite everyday actions unless you're in the habit of every day of going standing in a river, but very familiar actions. 
so one of the things that we train in Tai Chi, again going back to our mind, is to, to use images, to use ideas effectively, to bring about small changes in our body. And it requires a certain focus for our attention, of course. If you, your mind wanders too much, then that can be a bit confusing for, for the body. I'm sure we've all experienced uh, a time when we've suddenly found ourselves standing in a room thinking, what did I come here for? Or, intending to go and do one thing and finding that you've wandered into another room and started doing another because you're just a little bit distracted and thinking of several things at, at once. And Tai Chi really encourages us to have that central focus of attention. And eventually it's not exclusive. It's not that you don't notice other things, you're not aware of what else is, is going on, but there's this central area where we are focused. And then bringing your hands around in front of you and rooting down. So that sort of layered awareness is similar in a way to something that happens with our eyes in Tai Chi and Qigong, particularly in Tai Chi when we do the Tai Chi forms or some of the more complicated movements because we can divide our sight into two broad areas. One is what we might call the peripheral vision, the corner of our eye, and the other is the central vision, where we're actually looking. And most of us are able to, most of the time, have a, a kind of target in sight, but at the same time be aware of what's happening on the periphery. It's like Somebody once said to me, is it, is it like riding a bike round a corner? And it's exactly like that. You're looking where you're going, but there's a bit of you that's sort of aware of what's happening over your shoulder and so on. Same thing when you're walking. And in the same way, our minds are capable of, of, sort of re recognizing all sorts of things going on, but to maintain a a central focus of attention. In fact, our minds will naturally do that. They naturally scan our environment and we shouldn't be trying to block that. And then change into the wild goose. So this isn't what we would normally think of as concentration. And I came across a, a nice sort of idea, a nice image presented by a meditation teacher called Christina Feldman talking about this idea of what is referred to as concentration. She drew the analogy to a sheepdog herding sheep. The, the, the dogs encourage and sort of muster the sheep into a particular place to take them to a new field or whatever's going on a kind of gathering in. So rather than concentrating, think of gathering your thoughts. There will always be one or two that don't quite get gathered in or drift away. But be very patient with those. Changing now to the wild goose. We don't want a hard, exclusive concentration. And if the occasional sheep wanders off, we get to a point where we're able just to draw that back. And if there's anything significant in that particular attention, you suddenly realise that you're in the path of a bus or something like that, then of course you can act on it. We can see that quite clearly in this exercise, 
When your hands come up the middle, they're obviously in your central vision. As they go out to the side, you're still looking forwards, not up or to the sides. And yet, you're still aware of the movement of the hands in what we call the corner of our eye. Now, change to dragon plucks the stars from the sky. So we gradually build a, a significant and nearly constant awareness of what's going on in our bodies, how we're moving, and through that, a constant sort of connection to that quieter, more settled space. One more time. Change to pushing in four directions. Turn very much from the central part of your body, hips and waist. So that is the primary focus physically for, for us. But again, as we do that, we're aware of the movement of our shoulders and our hands, maybe even a little bit of movement in our legs as we do so. You'll notice that the the rhythm of the movement, and this applies to all the exercises in one way or another, brings us back. So this idea of, if you like, encouraging the lost sheep back into the fold is built into the very system. So we will notice after a while if, for instance, we've tightened up in our hips or our knees have locked back. And at first this can be quite frustrating. You think, oh, it's happened again. Why does that keep happening? But after a while you realise that this is just part of being human, really. And it ceases to be a major issue. It's just the corrections begin to almost make them sounds. And then changing.
and then I'm just comfortable adding the turn. And then change sides. Once again, add in the turn. Now we're rowing a boat in the middle of the lake. One more time. Yes, and then I'm back to the upright position, just letting your arms swing around. And in a way, back to the beginning, how does it feel now to try and find that quieter feeling, that settled feeling, physically rooting and so on? And then just slowly to a halt. Shake out. I think part of the difficulty in presenting these ideas in, in Tai Chi is that we can too easily get the impression that this is how we have to be in order to be able to do the, to do the movements. People sometimes say to me, well, you know, I can't do Tai Chi because I can't relax or I can't concentrate or, or, or anything like that. And it's certainly true that if you can do all of that, then the, 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 the movements come much more fluidly. Um, but it isn't the case that you can't do anything. In fact, you have to remember that the exercises and the practices are there to help you achieve these things as, as, as well. So it's not a kind of linear thing. So don't don't expect necessarily at the start of the session to have the same focus as you might do at the end. Um, or it might even be the other way around. Sometimes I found myself going out in the morning and I can be there for however long, half an hour or an hour. And then suddenly it's just the, 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 the focus of attention goes and, I'm, and, 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 and I need to, to take a break. We're not superhuman. We're not computers or robots or anything like that like that so there's all sorts of factors that that, that can affect it um one of this country's great teachers a guy called dan doherty commented recently in a in a book he brought, brought out a couple of years ago that tai chi was the martial art of change Th things change all around us all the time 
we change all the, the, the time. And so what we look for is, is if you like, a way of negotiating those, those changes. And in a way, a way of relating to those changes, it's a bit more creative perhaps than just purely resisting them. We, we tend to be very resistant to, to, to change. So you know, at some point you will lose the focus of your attention at more than one point, or, or, almost certainly. Um, and Tai Chi offers us a way back. And I think you know, everything I've ever come across from people on Tai Chi and meditation, all those kind of things, seem, seems, seems to agree with, with, with that. So standing, feet parallel, or slightly turned out, maybe a little bit more in this posture now in, in, in your mind. And just transferring your weight a little from side to side. Remember this image I've given you in in the past. It's, it's like I said about that pole going up through through the middle of your body. It doesn't exist, it exists of course, but as I move, can you see how it moves with me? It doesn't do this. Yeah, or uh, I can't make it bulge in the middle, but sometimes I, I find that I tend to do that and so on and so forth. I find it quite a difficult movement. Again, don't hold yourself rigidly to do this, but rather have the idea and see how close you, you, you can get to it. I quite often in with the sideways movement stand with a slightly wider stance. I actually find it easier to do this. I think with more space between the legs, it's more, more of a sense that the pelvis can, can, can drop. And also, I have a little bit more space to move in. You should only really be at this point be going to about 60% in each leg. And when you're in a, a hip width stance, that's hardly anything at all. By the time you realize you've started, it's time to stop almost. So it's, it's, it's quite tricky. And we'll start to move into the bear play, so just just, just letting your centre turn. And when we do bear play, we actually turn in the opposite direction to the one that we're moving. Quite often we would do this, say for hitting a ball in front of the shoulder, which we'll, we'll, we'll come to. But with this one, again, if I do it in the wider stance, but, but perhaps you'll see more easily, I move across and I sort of sit into that leg. And then I move across and I sit into the other leg. I kind of look towards the empty leg. I go back to the narrow stance. And at the same time, unusually in Tai Chi, we, we always come up and down a bit, but mostly we, we look for our shoulders to remain as, as, as level as possible, but this one has a sense of coming up and dropping down. It isn't meant to be a hard rule that our shoulders never move up and down, although I have come across ideas that where it should be, but most people, and you find most people when they do say a Tai Chi form, and a lot of the very, very good uh, teachers that I'm aware of will be going up and down just, just a little bit. Now with one hand, letting the movement follow. So as you come up, let your shoulder roll a little bit and then press down. And come back. On the side, you see there, I move across into the far leg. I turn, see how that's brought my hand back. And then I go into the near leg and that brings the hand forwards. And that little bit of an up and down push helps with this movement. Don't overdo the movement in your hand, but rather build it up, get the movement in your hip and then in your shoulder and just see how far the hand moves. Try not to have this idea that somehow the hand should be there or something you can say that's pulled my shoulder out of line. I do that. And the other thing to think about with this is 
see where my hand goes. So shoulder, arm, leg are in line with each other. Sometimes, because we turn, sometimes people are inclined to do this. Yeah. You want to avoid that and then try with your other arm. So I tend to think of those times when we do this, where it comes more across the body, it's a bit like the drunken bear, bit like the bear that's been at the rotting fruit and it's kind of staggering a little bit. So try and avoid that. And then alternating from side to side, the bear play, nice and smooth. Very flowing, but also very definite. The placing of your hand. When we do the stepping, I talk about planting the foot, and in the same way, you're planting your hand here. Again, it's not too far from, from your body. So imagine, for instance, if, if there was a stick that you were trying to push into the ground, you'd have it here and you'd drop your weight. Or if there was a ball in water and you wanted to push it down, you'd have it here. You wouldn't want your hand out there and try and push the stick down. You don't get the same sort of power through it. Through it. So this is, a, this is a very strong exercise, potentially. And this image of the bear was, of course, contributing to that. Nice and smooth in your spine, your ribs. Just a general feeling of your whole body being very gently massaged. And then <coughs> hitting the ball in front of the shoulder. Now we do turn in the direction that the weight is moving. It's interesting that you know, I've picked up these exercises in different places at different times, and yet they, they blend together, they flow together quite nicely. Um, that comes from this common root, this rhythm, this style of movement, means that even exercises that can often seem to have quite a different sort of history are compatible. If I turn my back you see now that how the hand is coming across. Again, your hand isn't actually coming across your body, it's going straight out from the shoulder. And then change to how gazes at the moon. Again, don't pull your arms across, but rather get that spiraling movement up through your back. Um, this is quite big, but. Be careful of your back, move as far as again that sense of space within your body allows. One more time, come back, straighten your feet up, hold the ball, and circle. Try and keep your hands in position. Keep going. One of the ways you can work with this is 
to take something like a small stick or a ball. I've got here uh, the, the inside of a, a, a kitchen tin foil dispenser and just move around like this. So you can see my hands continue to hold the stick as opposed to doing something like this and the stick gets dropped. And then go back the other way. So wherever possible, we, we don't want to, if you like, be mechanical about these things. So if you do use a, a stick or something to help you with this, it can be quite good to do that, but don't do it exclusively. Do give yourself a chance to stretch your imagination a little bit. Do it without, occasionally. One more time. And it's actually a very simple exercise that, but it's got surprising depth, or perhaps not so surprising if we think about how, how, how Tai Chi works. I never used to do it a great deal. Um, and then one day with one of my more advanced classes, I just, for some reason, I don't even know quite why I did it, but I was just thinking about it. So, let's have a go at this. I said, it's not, not much, it's, not, it's a bit of a kind of like boring exercise, but we'll, we'll do it because it's, it's good for the hips. We actually spent about half an hour pick, un, unpicking the movement. And as we did it, I was, I was thinking, for a boring exercise, not much happening. There's a great deal going on within the body that I, that I hadn't noticed before. This is very much the way with Tai Chi, I think. So any of these exercises will repay that sort of in-depth look. And in particular, it's worth doing that with the very simple exercises. Now, one foot forwards. So transferring your weight. Trying to maintain the orientation of your upper body, looking straight ahead. And again, if you imagine doing this in water, you'll feel how changes happen in the upper part of your body when you're going forward you feel the pressure of the water in your belly in your chest your front leg in particular when you go back it's more the back shoulders top of the back leg they all have to work together so that when you go through the water you're not sort of waving around as is often the case i mean if you went and did this in water, particularly if you did it in the sea or something like that, where there were waves and currents and things like that. It's almost impossible to maintain this upright posture unless you want to really strain. And of course, we don't want to do that. Now, sink back and just let the front foot come up a little bit. Turn the foot out slightly and then let the heel come up. So now that the feet are turned out, I'll, I'll exaggerate, you can see how my body's turning. And you may find that actually helps to raise the foot. Because you see here, I come forwards. When I turn, and I'm exaggerating this now, see how my hip is coming forwards, and that's going to pull on the leg. So the easy way of just reducing that pull is to let the heel come up. So this is perhaps one of those movements that is best felt when we exaggerate it, but which tends to happen. Remember, we're not rigid machines. So when we say looking forwards or not turning or doing this or that or, or the other, we have to realize that we shouldn't be straining to make that happen. But in fact, this is quite useful because that slight turning and again, I'm, I'm still very much exaggerating this. 
actually helps us to begin to move the foot. So this coming in, this of course is what we would do in normal walking. We would swing, you know, we, you know, we swing our arms, don't we? We swing our arms and, and that kind of thing going on to get, to get the momentum for the leg. and shake out. <clears throat> nothing should be set in stone and nothing should be taken too literally when we're talking about these things. If I'm thinking about the centre of the body rotating, then actually in, in, in a given movement like this, there could be several planes of rotation, horizontal and vertical and, 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 and so on and so forth. But clearly physically that isn't what, what what is happening. We're using imagery to try and encourage processes within the body. For what it's worth, I sometimes think that in this area, it's a bit like, um, well, like Russian dolls. You know, you've got a doll within a doll within a doll. It's like you've got a, a ball, and then you've got a slightly smaller ball and so on and so forth, perhaps an infinite number of balls. And each one is rotating in, in different ways. And we just let the body get on with dealing with, with, with that image, both in terms of musculature. If you look at the diagram of the muscles around this central area of the body, it's very, very complicated. There's muscles all over the place. And, and so we, we, we have the capability of making very small, very subtle changes, lots of small subtle changes, pretty much at the, the, the same time, but also energetically you know if you if you look at water in the river or flowing down a stream or something like that it doesn't just go straight down the stream it's all little side currents and so on and so forth that 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 that, that would affect it so you know, we 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 can do a certain amount of physical um, um, analysis but there, there are limits to how useful that could be now have your other foot forwards so understanding these exercises and developing these exercises is really, it's, it's very much like listening to a piece of music. You know, if you listen to a piece of music, you might focus on the rhythm or the melody or the words of a song or something like that. Um, but the experience of the whole piece of music is more than just that. So it's perfectly reasonable in Tai Chi to focus on particular aspects, but in the end, the exercises and the, and, and the movements really take off in those moments when we get a little bit beyond that. We're still aware of those things, but we've gone a little bit beyond that to the actual experience of it. Right, it's in your toes and your heel. In my experience, that isn't predictable when that happens. Sometimes you'll be caught up in details and so on and so forth. And then every now and then it seems as though we've, we've kind of come through the clouds and we're back in this sort of like vast sky where we're just doing the movements. And then with the step in. What we can do when we sort of analyze this slight turning or maybe even exaggerate this slight turning is be a little bit more aware of the, the role of the center part of our body in just moving our foot. And when we talk about the center guiding the movement, controlling the movement and the, the arms expressing it, we should really be thinking about the periphery of the body, not just the arms and the hands, but the whole of the outer region of the body. So now bring your foot in and step forwards. And depending on the movement you could do, that could include your hip, you know, the actual physical hip, it could include your elbow, your shoulder, your knee, And then 
walk in the other direction. So when we look at Tai Chi in its martial aspect, which doesn't necessarily come directly into the, uh, these particular sessions, but you know, when we make strikes, for instance, yes, we strike with, with our hands, but also elbows, shoulders, hips, knee, I mean, all sorts of things. The, 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 foot. the whole body really is used in, in that way, according to what is, to, to what is required. So again, we have this idea of a sort of central area of, 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 of the body connected to, to a periphery. So it's like, it's like a, a bicycle wheel. If you spin a bicycle wheel, then you know, anywhere around the rim of the wheel that, that, that you touch it, your, your finger sort of ricochets off because the energy is there all the way around. And what, which particular way we, we, we we move at any particular time is really down to intent, you know, depending on which movement we're doing or what we're trying to do. That's where um, our intent will will go. But again, never exclusively, never to never at the expense of what's going on in the rest of our body. So put one foot forwards again. So think your weight back. So pigeon spreads its wings. I'm going to come a little bit closer. You'll. You won't be able to see my feet so as well. I want you to, to watch what's going on in my in in my elbows. So I go forwards and backwards. I'm not doing anything at all yet in in my arms. But it's like there's this wave that pushes forwards through through my body. Again, I'm going to exaggerate. This time as I go forwards, that wave pushes my elbows forwards and then draws them back. So if you exaggerate this, see what you're feeling in your ribs and so on as, as you do this. And eventually that movement pulls your hands out. Another way of thinking is it's like a ball that's expanding within the space between your arms and your body. And eventually what that will do is almost reluctantly your fingers get drawn apart. So the pigeon spreads its wings. On the back is a bit now seeing that. Make sure that at the end of the movement your hands are still in front of your shoulders, your elbows are still in front of your shoulders. Don't do this. As soon as you do that, you will tighten up. Remember, you know, we're not trying to stretch with this. Notice the movement here. Try it with just one hand. Just here where your, your, your shoulder meets the chest, the area there opening out and then contracting. Do one more and then changing the fisherman cast the net which at first sight feels quite different but many of the things that are going on are very similar the breathing would be different but I haven't really sort of focused on that today but again if I come a little bit closer when I go forward like we're swaying in the river this is exaggerated there's that that same opening there and that opening that we had in pigeon spreads its wings and the contraction there helps to bring the hands through. And when I go back, I can just, just over there behind the shoulder blade, the same thing. Still a primary driver of the movement is going to be transfer of your weight, but all these little movements build on that. So I don't want you to forget to move your weight. I want you to notice these other elements. So 
So this gives us quite a lot of movement, quite a big movement. And when we make the change into pushing a wave, we want to keep that. You come back and now let your elbows go out to the sides. Again, this is very exaggerated. But if I do this, I'll show you from the side, if I do this, see how my elbows go now? Again, here, there's the opening. So part of what pushes the hand forwards is that area contracting and your intent directing the movement forwards. And when we do that with both hands and when it's combined with the movement of the weight, we get a sense for the real strength that is within the movement. So I suppose you could say that we're also using muscles and parts of the body that pull the hands in towards each other, like you were trying to squeeze on a, on a ball between your elbows. What we don't want to do is to take the elbows behind. Now we've lost the connection. We do do that in, um, we do let the, the elbows go behind, as you noticed, in pushing a wave, sorry, in fisherman cast a net. But then we're pulling the arms through, we're not pushing against something. So that makes a, a little bit of a difference. One more time. Bring the feet parallel. So if you were going to roll a ball along the ground or even throw a ball, you might have the, 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 the ball in your hand. You might do that, you might use that elasticity of the body to, to throw the ball. But if you were pushing a wheelbarrow, for instance, you wouldn't have your hand behind and try and push the wheelbarrow in, in, in that direction. It would, it, 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 it would feel long. You might pull it in that, uh, in, in that way, but you wouldn't do that. You'd want your hand there to, to, to push the wheelbarrow or the shopping trolley or whatever you like. So, Pitch and spread its wings on the other side. So have your other foot forwards. So the idea of power and strength, internal strength, is very important in Tai Chi. Obviously, again, that is something that is very um, related to the martial aspect, but it shouldn't be seen as purely about that because we're talking about our own internal strength to perform everyday actions about the strength of the movement the energy itself and that is something that can affect our well-being in lots of different ways because if that energy is, is has, has that development of the internal strength then we take the wisdom of Chinese medicine, it's going to have an impact on, on, on our well-being in all sorts of ways. This is somebody called Yang Cheng Fu once described it as a, a different quality of strength. One more time. And then fisherman cast the net. and push it away.
one more time. And bring your feet back. Let's put your hands together. Tap it over your face. Over your head and neck. Down to one shoulder and your arm. The other side. And your back. Round your hips. And relax. Nice and light on your belly. So we're running our normal programs this this week. Then there'll be a two week break. During that, there will be a couple of things up on YouTube that you'll be able to access. I'll be sending out the links for that so next 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 weekend and the following week weekend. Just little sessions to help you keep some kind of practice. And then from the 21st of September, we're back with our, our online programs. The, 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 the beginnings of a return to, to sort of face-to-face -face classes, um, who knows how that's going to go over, over, over the next couple of months. Um, my intention is to keep the online program going, certainly up until um, the to like Christmas time because because I think and, you know, any face to face classes I do will work around it. There may be some tweaks through through the autumn to the timing of classes, but but I will try and keep a, a, a full service going. But this week is, is is as normal. So thank you for joining in. Let's do embrace tiger return to the mountain. Just sinking down and pushing. It is always useful to focus on what it is that brings you back to the mountain. One more time. And stand, take a couple of slow, gentle breaths. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. So take care. Enjoy the rest of that. I don't know what it's like where, where you are.